Do you have something at home that contains a laser? Probably yes. Do you know how a laser works? Probably no. Do you want to find out? Well, you clicked, so come on in, let's go. The laser was invented in the 1960s. Why though? Why not the 1860s or the 1920s? As long as you have electricity and a good grasp of optics, shouldn't you be able to build a laser? You might think that, but no. Lasers are at least as much atomic physics as they are optics. They are all about how atoms interact with light. So we first needed quantum physics to understand how that works. Because there is a physical process called stimulated emission. And it goes like this. An atom that interacts with a photon, a particle of light, can emit a perfect copy of this photon. And sure, a single photon is always too weak to even register at our human scale. But if you run this process a lot, if you make gazillions of atoms do that at the same time, you basically get a laser. It's right there in the name too. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Of course, there is much more to lasers though. So let's begin with the basics. As always, light is an electromagnetic wave, but as we're also doing atomic physics here, we will also need to assume that light is made up of tiny particles called photons, each carrying a packet of energy. This quantity of energy is called a quantum, and this is where quantum physics got its name from. How these two concepts fit together is an entirely different can of worms though, and it will require its very own video. Uh, this is the famous particle wave duality. As for atoms, they are made up of the heavy but tiny nucleus and a cloud of electrons buzzing around it. One of the consequences of quantum mechanics is that this electron cloud can only ever have specific allowed energy levels. We say the energy is quantized. If you solve the Schrödinger equation for a specific atom, you get an equation for all the different energy levels. Each energy has an associated quantum state, which will determine how the electron cloud is distributed around the nucleus, uh, or in other words, what the atom looks like in this situation. This energy diagram can become quite complex, but the thing to remember is that what you see here are not positions in space. These are energies. We call the lowest possible energy the ground state and the other states are called excited states. Now what happens when a photon and an atom meet? How do they interact? Well, that depends on whether they are compatible. If the photon's energy is exactly right to lift the atom from its current state to a higher state, then the atom can absorb this photon and use the absorbed energy to move up to this excited state. This is called an atomic transition, or more classically, a quantum jump. If the energies are not matching, then the two do not interact and just go their separate ways. Let's be a bit more precise here. What does exactly right mean? Well, quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory, meaning that every process has a given probability to happen. And the closer a photon's energy is to the required energy of the atom, the more likely the absorption is. Once the atom is in an excited state, there is a probability for it to spontaneously emit a photon and fall back again to the ground state. The reason for this is that systems always tend to the state of lowest energy. So sooner or later this will happen. And we will not have to wait for long because this usually happens within a millionth of a second. Unfortunately, this process is fundamentally random. So it will happen at a random time and the photon will be emitted in a completely random direction, etc. These two processes are rather straightforward. They are what you would expect. But there is a third one that is a little bit odd. It turns out that if a photon interacts with an excited atom and its energy is equal to the gap between the atom states, 
then the mere presence of the photon causes the atom to transition down to the lower state. The energy this sets free is emitted as a photon and remarkably, this emitted photon is identical to the interacting photon. Same direction, same polarization, same phase. This is called stimulated emission. So in a roundabout way, this means that photons can borrow energy from an atom to perfectly copy themselves. And while this is cool in the atomic world, if it is to ever matter in our world, we will need to do this at scale. If we have a large number of atoms in ground states and we bombard them with photons, we will excite them and uh, later they will spontaneously drop back while emitting a photon. Unfortunately, this will happen at a random time and in a random direction, so this is far from the avalanche effect that we're looking for. Only when we have already excited atoms, photons shot at those will trigger stimulated emission. Each photon will be copied and we get the avalanche. And that's the catch. In order to be able to run this process, we already need atoms in an excited state. A lot of them and with a constant resupply. Whether an atom is excited or not depends on the temperature of its environment. This is represented by the Boltzmann distribution. It says that the higher the energy, the less likely it is for an atom to get there and then to stay there. This means that the vast majority of atoms under normal conditions are not excited. They're in the ground state. And we can excite them by shooting photons of the correct energy at them. For example, using a high intensity flashlight. This is the first part of a laser, the energy pump. We need this energy supply to create lots of excited atoms. The second part is the active medium or gain medium. This is where all the atoms sit. Historically, the first laser was constructed around a ruby crystal, aluminum oxide with chromium. The chromium atoms are the ones absorbing the pump photons, creating what is called a population inversion. Due to the energy supply, most of the atoms are moved up into the excited state. At this point, we need a first refinement to even get to the population inversion. If the energy for excitation and stimulated emission really were identical, the two processes would constantly compete with each other and you would trigger both of them randomly. So we need an additional energy level as an intermediate step. Um, let's look at a specific example to make this clearer. This is a simplified version of the energy diagram of the chromium in the ruby. We have this intermediary excited state where we transfer our ground state atoms to. In reality, these are actually a couple of states, but this doesn't really matter, it's still the same concept. From there, they quickly decay into a lower excited state, getting rid of the energy by vibrations in the crystal structure. So no photons are emitted here. They are now in the excited state that will be used for stimulated emission. Note that this state and the original state have different energies, so you can excite the atom using this energy and stimulate emission with this energy. Secondly, Note that the second excited state is a so-called metastable state, meaning the atoms will stay there for a long time. At atomic scales, a long time is seconds. This will help us because the longer they stay there, the more likely it becomes that they are triggered into stimulated emission later. Let's go back to our earlier diagram. The atoms are excited by pumping and drop down into the metastable second excited state. Eventually, Photons are spontaneously emitted and trigger the whole avalanche. And with this, we already have the most important part of the entire laser. There is one final important component to the laser and that is an optical resonator, just two mirrors. This has a couple of functions. For one, we want to select only those photons that are in the axial direction of the laser because 
we want our beam to be focused and have a fixed direction. Second, we want all those photons that are in the right direction to trigger more of the same, so they are reflected and sent through the gain medium again and again. We can also use the resonator to get rid of unwanted frequencies or modes, uh, either by adding some optical elements, which do just that, or by designing the resonator dimensions in such a way that those waves will not be able to build out a standing wave, but they will interfere out destructively. Interestingly, as the mirrors are not infinitely large, the beam will also be diffracted by them, in exactly the same way as it would be by a hole the size of the mirror. The many reflections of the beam between the two mirrors is equivalent to sending a beam through a large number of holes, and this will bend a lot of it out of the central axis, meaning these portions of the wave are lost. In the end we will get a stationary mode, and that is the reason why a laser beam leaving the laser will have a Gaussian profile, because it is shaped like a Gaussian function. But if the laser is kept between two mirrors, how will it ever be able to leave the apparatus? Well, in reality there are no 100% reflective mirrors. Some portion of the light will always get through. We want one side to be as perfect as possible, so here we typically have a 99.5% or even more effective mirror. On the other side though, the mirror is only 95-98% to reflective. Why? Because we want a small part of the beam to leave. And this is the beam emitted from the laser. It doesn't leave the resonator through a hole. It just passes through an imperfect mirror. Now, uh, this description applies to a very classical solid-state laser, pretty much the way it was invented in the 1960s. However, there is a great variability of lasers today, some of which work in a completely different way. For example, semiconductor lasers do not create photons by optically pumping atomic transitions, but by controlling electron-hole annihilation at a p-m junction through electric current. Uh, the point is that a laser has become more of a general principle that can be realized in many different ways. There are now different laser technologies with varying cost, simplicity, power output, frequency, etc. Currently, we have lasers emitting ultraviolet light, any kind of visible light, and various types of infrared. Basically, there are two large clusters of applications for lasers. First, we can use low-powered lasers to transmit or read signals. And secondly, we can use high-powered lasers to burn. There are a lot of medical uses, most of which use the burn setting for surgery, most notably eyes or skin, but also cancer. Lasers on lower settings are also used in medical imaging technologies. Industrial uses like cutting, engraving, printing and welding are also mostly based on high-powered lasers. Lithography is another important application. In fact, you could not manufacture any modern semiconductors without lasers. For information technologies, lasers are mainly used to send signals, like all of fiber optics, or to read signals, like from CDs or DVDs or barcode scanners. And there are many more technologies based on laser, for example, LiDAR, which is a variant of radar but using laser beams being reflected off targets. Lasers as military weapons, um, despite decades of sci-fi movies depicting it, only have some limited applications. They are used much more for targeting and range finding than for actually shooting. Finally, lasers have become an essential part of much of scientific research since the 90s, even including particle accelerators and nuclear fusion. And while one of the inventors of the laser joked in the 1960s that the laser is a solution in search for a problem, nobody would say that anymore.
Esse é o funk do povão.